Okay, everybody. Welcome to the second in our series of lectures to mark the Decade of Centenaries program here with Loud County Library Service. I'm joined by uh, Timothy McMahon. Tim is an associate professor of history at Marquette University in Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a noted center of brewing, which is something it has in common with Drahada and Dundalk. Um, Tim's a social historian whose research looks at national identity, imperialism, and popular culture in Ireland. He's previously published Grand Opportunity, the Gaelic Revival in Irish Society, 1893 to 1910, an edited edition of Pora Fahi's War of Independence, Recollections of a Galway Gaelic Leaguer, and he was also a contributing editor to the 2017 essay collection, Ireland in an Imperial World, Citizenship, Opportunism, and Subversion. His current work is uh, concerns identity along the border, but he's not going to talk to us about that tonight. What he's going to talk to us is his research for uh, another project called Era Imperator, Ireland's Imperial Ambivalence. So welcome, Tim. Thank you, Tommy. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to be sharing my screen here uh, in just a second, but I wanted to thank uh, uh, Louth. Uh, library services and the county council, as well as uh, especially your decade of centenaries historian Tom Tormey, uh, for the invitation to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, indeed, I really wish I could be with you. Um, uh, doing these uh, on-screen sessions has been uh, a bit of a godsend during uh, uh, this COVID time, but uh, I would uh, uh, really welcome the opportunity to be with you uh, in Ireland. Uh, this is two summers in a row now that I've I've had to miss out on being in Ireland, and I miss it a great deal. Um, I'm going to start with the screen sharing, if I can make it work. Let's see here. I need to go back a couple of slides, if you will. Excuse me. There we go. Um, I'm going to share the screen for a bit, talk for about 35 or 40 minutes, uh, and then uh, come back live on screen, uh, and and uh, we'll we'll do some question and answer. I'm I'm delighted to do that with you. We are in a a fascinating year of this decade of centenaries, uh, having just passed the hundredth anniversary of the truce that suspended the Irish War of Independence, and shortly before that, the hundredth anniversary of partition, creating a border at the north of your county. Uh, that was contested at that time and remains so to this day. The relationships of both new Irish states to the British Empire were at the center of much thinking that occurred during that summer and autumn 100 years ago. And it's to those relationships that I'd like to turn for our time this evening. The legacies of empire are complex and contested, and historians, not to mention politicians and the general public, are beginning to wrestle with them in, our, in their full complexity. I can't do justice to all that we have been working through in my time with you. The work is broad and varied. And in fact, I'm really more qualified to speak about the modern, let us say the 19th and 20th centuries uh, and the implications in those centuries of imperial relationships than I am about the early modern period. Nonetheless, I'm going to begin with some sense of that longer term implication of actions of Irish actors on the imperial stage before turning to some more specific comments about the period I know best. And then I'll conclude with some thoughts about where I think the field is going. It's an exciting time indeed to be doing this work. In the context of the present commemorations, Ireland's fraught imperial legacies have received significant attention. Throughout these years, President Higgins has called for ethical remembering of the varied opinions and experiences of Irish people a century ago and he has himself been a distinctive voice on the legacies of the British Empire here and elsewhere. His efforts have included holding one of his Machnav seminars on the subject of Ireland and empire, his frequent exhortations during the 2016 Easter centenary events to recognize the anti-colonial legacies of the challenge posed by the rebels in 1916. And then in 2017, he offered sobering and important uh, acknowledgement during a landmark address to the Parliament of Western Australia in Perth, that Irish emigrants who went to Australia were not merely victims of discrimination, sexual and labor abuses, 
Some also were involved in or acquiesced in injustices aimed at the Aboriginal people of the Southern continent. If we are to be truly unblinking in our gaze, he said, we must acknowledge that while most Irish emigrants experienced some measure, often a large measure of prejudice and injustice, there were some among the number who inflicted injustice too. It's that element of tension I want to probe with you today. Ireland was, as I wrote a few years ago, both a laboratory of and a lab partner in empire. Now, as we'll see in a, in a few minutes, that dual reality was largely because of Ireland's relationship to the British Empire. But if we cast our gaze back into that early modern period, let us say to the era of the Ulster plantations, which was, after all, an act of imperial expansion <coughs> uh, uh, that coincided with the founding of colonies in North America that became part of my own country's national mythology, Irish men and women participated in the armies, administrations, conquests, management, and disruption of the empires of Spain, Austria, and France, and through them, uh, and later through the British Empire, the expansion of the Roman Catholic Church's spiritual empire. The legacy of those ties can be detected in the names of some of the more famous 19th century figures associated with various states, including those who helped to break up empires, such as Bernardo O'Higgins of Chile and Peru, or those who served empires and their successor states as well, including Marshal Patrice de Macmahon, who saw frequent service in Algeria from the time of the French conquest in 1830, service in the Crimean War and at the battles of Magenta and Sedan before suppressing the Paris Commune and ultimately becoming president of the French Third Republic. These examples point to a reality that only becomes more evident when we turn our attention to the connection with the British Empire. That is, by the 19th century, the world was being shaped by empires. There were, in many ways, they were, excuse me, in many ways, the leading form of large state governance. And not just European empires, mind you. One of Ireland's most famous servants in an empire was Sir Robert Hart, uh, born in Porta Down uh, County Antrim in 1835, Hart graduated from Queen's College, Belfast at the age of 17. He joined the British consular service bound for China, and he so impressed Chinese imperial authorities with his linguistic skills that they hired him to join their nascent maritime customs service. By the age of 28, he had become its leader the inspector general, and he would spend more than four decades in China, most of them leading the maritime customs. At the time, there were roughly 200 foreign employees of the service, but by the turn of the 20th century, under his direction, he had overseen the growth of the customs to include some 1,000 foreign and 4,600 Chinese-born staff. He established a string of 137 lighthouses along the coast of China, and he founded China's postal services as well. In 1912 alone, one of his admiring former employees wrote that there were over 6,000 postal establishments already with 127,000 miles of courier connections and the service dealt with 421 million postal articles. Now, these few examples point to a reality that shapes our discussion. The Irish, like many in Europe, were on the move beyond the shores of their home island. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, tens of millions of Europeans left the continent, mitigating, or excuse me, migrating to corners of the globe with North America and South America as the most popular destinations. By one estimate, something like 8 million left Ireland between 1800 and the 1920s. Some 7.5 million of them between the 1820s and 1920s. To be sure, the famine catalyzed that process, but the point is that it was underway before 1845 and continued for eight more decades. If we focus on the period between the 1820s and 1920s alone, the numbers show that the United States was the primary destination uh, for nearly two thirds of those emigrants, some five million people. But 
roughly 2.5 million went elsewhere, either in the United Kingdom or to points across the British Empire. That means that as the Irish diaspora of the 19th and 20th centuries developed, as communications networks, including telegraph lines and networks of goods and people traveling under sail and then steam grew, the Irish played an outsized role in shaping what is collectively known as the British Empire. I use the term outsized advisedly, but it applies here. I'm not merely suggesting that this because Ireland is a small island. Instead, I mean that if you look at the populations of the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and even the Cape, uh, Irish-born and first-generation Irish made up larger proportions of those settler colonies than they did the population of the United Kingdom itself. So in this map, or this uh, graph here, uh, the Irish population actually is the, the purple bar in each of these uh, uh, segments. English would be the blue bar, Scots the orange, uh, and Welsh uh, the shorter blue. And in this, you'll see that uh, the Irish are making up somewhere around 11% of the UK population. This is about 1900 here. But if you look at Canada, there's more than 20% of the population of Canada at that time is coming from Ireland. Uh, more than 25% uh, of Australia, uh, just around 20% in New Zealand, and just under the Irish uh, home average, uh, about 7.5% at the Cape. So the Irish are playing an outsized role in settler colonies. If one looks only uh, at the Australian colony of Victoria, what you see in the wake of the famine is explosive growth in the third quarter of the 1800s, spurred both by the famine and by a gold rush uh, to Victoria. Uh, between 1845 and 1870, the population grew 20 times over to about 170,000, and fully 100,000 of them were Irish born. They and their counterparts in other parts of the world communicated with family back home. They sent goods and money home and their communities abroad helped to shape how the Irish at home saw themselves as well. And they did their best to keep up with news and events from home. So there's this really interesting interaction that uh, you know, diaspora studies and empire studies are helping us to, uh, to sort through. Equally important in this was that as the British empire expanded, its use of warfare to extend and protect its possessions involved Irish soldiers and its growing ranks of public servants also recruited heavily in Ireland as well. What this meant was that schools from the national schools, which were themselves imperial agents, right, in that they only taught through the medium of the English language on an island that in the 1840s still had about four and a half million Irish speakers, to colleges and universities, which adapted their curricula in order to prepare students to sit for civil service examinations or medical licenses, or indeed, service in the armed forces. A colonial clerkship provided opportunity, and among these, a career in the Indian civil service was the ultimate prize. In 1857, fully 33% of recruits to the Indian civil service came from Ireland, and though the percentage of ICS officers from Ireland declined over time, 15% of them still came from Ireland in the mid-1880s, and 80% of them were from Catholic middle-class backgrounds. The army saw a similar overrepresentation of Irish recruits. In 1830, for instance, when Ireland's share of the United Kingdom population was just about one third, fully 42% of British army soldiers were Irish born. Again, as with the colonial services, the percentages of recruits dropped over the course of the century but the numbers became, if anything, proportional to the population at home. To be sure, as in much of Irish society into the 20th century, those families of the landed elite, often successors to the imperial incorporation uh, of Ireland into the Anglosphere, achieved higher ranks in the various services than did the Catholic Irish. These included names like Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, whose military exploits prefigured his political influence throughout the first half of the 19th century. Frederick Hamilton Temple Blackwood, the first Marcus of Dufferin and Ava, 
whose career included diplomatic postings around the world on appointments as both Governor General of Canada and Viceroy of India. Richard Southwell Burke, known for his most of his career as Lord Nace, but eventually as the sixth Earl of Mayo, who served three times as Chief Secretary of Ireland and eventually also as Viceroy of India. Field Marshal Sir Garnet Walsley, made Viscount Walsley in 1885, a native of Golden Bridge County, Dublin. He became the most decorated of British commanders in the second half of the century in campaigns stretching from India and the Crimea to Canada, West Africa, Egypt, and Sudan. To mix, however, we should add a number of Catholic Irish, including some from backgrounds similar to those already mentioned. Here I'm thinking of somebody like Jenico Preston from just south of, of Louth, uh, the 14th Viscount Gormanston, who served as governor of the Leeward Islands, British Guyana, and Tasmania in the late 1800s. And also from uh, Catholic families uh, of much more modest means, uh, middling families, I suppose, in an Irish context, but uh, a, a more modest means nonetheless. Uh, these included people like John Pope Hennessy, uh, not pictured here, uh, Pope Hennessy, who was the third of five sons of a Cork Hyde merchant and whose parliamentary career as a conservative Irish nationalist in the 1850s put him in close touch with Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli, in turn, helped start his career in the colonial service by making him governor of Labuan, uh, an island near Borneo. He would later serve in West Africa, the Bahamas, the Windward Islands, Hong Kong, and ultimately Mauritius or William Francis Butler in the lower center there, the younger son of a Tipperary strong farmer whose career in the army stretched from the late 1850s to the early 1900s. A close friend of Walsley's, Butler reached the rank of Lieutenant General and was at one time the highest ranking Catholic in the British army. Charles Gavin Duffy in the lower right there, the Monaghan born young Irelander who avoided conviction after the 1848 rising won election to parliament in the 1850s with the Irish Independent Party, but then emigrated to Victoria, where he would serve twice as premier of the colonial parliament. Or indeed, uh, Sir Michael Dwyer, graduate of the Jesuits St. Stanislaus College, Tullabeg, who served as Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab at the time of the Amritsar massacre, defending the commanding officer of Amritsar, General Reginald Dyer, who himself had been educated in Cork. This who's who merely scratches the surface of imperial involvement and apparent support. To be sure, I could make a similar list of people who opposed the empire and its expansion. Irish examples are legion, and in fact, Irish resistance to the British connection seemingly inspired resistance elsewhere. One fascinating example discussed by my colleague Jill Bender came toward the end of the 1860s when officials uh, back in Britain were removing military support from New Zealand in the wake of the land wars there. Government officials in New Zealand began to worry about rumors of the presence of Irishmen meeting with Maori, uh, uh, with the Maori king. These Irishmen were known uh, in uh, the Maori tongue as Finiana, that is Fenians. And the fear that an international conspiracy among Fenians spread resistance to the far corners of the globe, inspired Governor Bowen of New Zealand to plead for ongoing support from Britain. The notion of an international Fenian conspiracy, while overblown in this case, certainly was something that would recur and that bore fruit in and after 1916, of course, and theorizing about how to take down what some considered to be a bloated empire was part of the work of the Fenian turned parliamentarian J.J. O'Kelly, as my friend Paul Townend has documented. Now, why offer this counterpoint? I think it's important to say that on the island of Ireland, there were alternative paths to the one that involved purely national or indeed anti-imperial resistance, that supporters of empire served in the same century that stretched from the Society of the United Irishmen to the pro-Boer commando units that included Major John McBride and the Australian Irishman Arthur Lynch, strikes me as worth consideration. That someone like a General Butler or a Pope Hennessy could consider running for office as a Home Rule MP, and indeed Pope Hennessy did that at the end of his life, speaks to the need to see Irish politics and the relationship of Irish nationalism to empire 
as something more complicated than merely that one was either for or against Britain. There were many for whom support of empire did not necessarily preclude support for some form of Irish self-government. William Redmond MP, brother of the Irish Parliamentary Party leader, John Redmond, is an ideal case in point. A firm believer in tenant right in Ireland, uh, indeed jailed on occasions uh, for uh, uh, his work on behalf of tenants, um, a, a vocal opponent of what he saw as unjust imperial wars, uh, uh, Redmond uh, was in October of 1899 expelled from the House of Commons for his vitriolic speech against the impending conflict in the Cape. Yet he believed that Australia was a prime example of what the Irish could do supporting a modernizing new land. Like his brother, he had also married an Australian Irish woman he met while traveling to the Antipodes to raise money for the Home Rule cause. And when the third Home Rule Bill came before the House of Commons in 1912, with the full expectation that it would become law, this anti-imperialist told the House that its passage would, quote, make the Irish soldier like the Irish race for the first time in their history into friends and not the dissatisfied subjects of the British Empire, unquote. And we know that poor Redmond would be among those Irish soldiers to die in the course of the Great War. Um, uh, ironically, his death would lead to the election in East Clare of Eamon de Valera, the leader of what would be the party that challenged the British connection most successfully and most deeply. In some ways, de Valera's election seems symbolic of the shift toward the anti-imperial element in Irish society becoming the more dominant in the 20th century. Certainly, the Irish Free State era and the Republic would serve as shining examples to anti-colonialists around the world. In the mid 20th century, some who were headed to Britain would make side trips to Ireland to meet with the leaders of the new state or to reconnect with missionary teachers who had helped to educate them in the many mission schools that flourished under the flag of the empire. In fact, um, uh, ironically, uh, uh, you, you can look at, at uh, uh, cartoons. I, I don't have one in, in the slide, unfortunately, but uh, you can look at cartoons of uh, leaders of newly independent African states emerging from prison cells, prison cells which were referred to as uh, uh, you know, schools for uh, prime ministers. Uh, and often on the, the walls of the cell will be depicted the names of people who have been uh, uh, in those cells before and the head of every list is de Valera. Now, it would be a, a simple matter, I think, uh, uh, to leave the relationship of Ireland to the British Empire there. The coming of an independent state marking a transition to a new ethos on the island. But I think that would miss the point on several grounds. First, it ignores the critical role that the free state, while still a dominion of the empire and commonwealth, helped spur one of the great constitutional innovations in British history. That is the Statute of Westminster, which enabled dominions to repeal prior legislation and prevented future British generated legislation from having the force of law in a dominion without the approval of that local government. In other words, many of the constitutional innovations uh, brought forward uh, in the 1930s by Fianna Fáil and later on in the century, uh, many of these were possible, made more possible thanks to the innovation uh, that uh, the Statute of Westminster had brought. Second, assuming that the independent state moved away from all imperial connections entirely ignores the reality that men and women from the independent state continued to serve in the empire, whether in policing or colonial services in Palestine or in the legal offices during uh, uh, the campaigns in Cyprus, or indeed in ongoing missionary work, not in service to the British Empire, but in service to their church, be it Catholic or Protestant, but under a British flag. One intriguing example of such service was the career of Sister Patricia, pictured here, born Nora Lochnan, who had joined the missions through the convent at Artfoyle County Cork and served in the Gold Coast beginning in the late 1920s. Her religious name, Patricia, is a direct link to the Republican campaign in the War of Independence and a tribute to her late brother, Pat, 
who along with their other brother, Harry, was captured and then brutally tortured and killed by the Black and Tans in a notorious incident still marked in South, South Galway uh, that occurred in November of 1920. More local example for you all uh, would be the Bellingham family of Castle Bellingham, which was knit into the British Empire from the 16th century onward. Members of that family included Sir William Bellingham, the first baronet who was controller of stores for the Royal Navy and outfitted George Vancouver's expeditions of the Pacific coast of North America. And indeed, Bellingham as a name adorns the bay and a city just north of Seattle, Washington. Sir Sidney Bellingham, who was a businessman, landlord, newspaper man, and politician in modern day Quebec for decades before retiring home to County Louth. Sidney's nephew, Sir Henry Bellingham, who converted to Catholicism and became a home ruler uh, in the 1880s, uh, and also became an advocate for the Gaelic revival in the early 1900s, hosting the county fesh for several years at the start of the 20th century. And his son, Sir Edward, the fifth baronet, whose career in the British army included service in the Boer War, as well as the First and Second World Wars. And later, after the Second World War, Sir Edward served as vice counsel in the British Embassy in Guatemala. In other words, service to the empire continuing. A third point, I mentioned the century old partition of Ireland at the beginning. I'm not advocating any political move here, only pointing out that one reason for partition was the conviction of some on the island of Ireland uh, and on the island of Britain that at least part of the island needed to remain within the United Kingdom. It did because the people of Ulster, so they said, were British. Leaving aside that three of the nine counties in Ulster were consciously kept outside the new state and that a significant percentage of people in the new state did not consider themselves British. But it also did, and this is evident in the discussions at the time, uh, it did, uh, uh, it occurred because the cabinet was wary about the impact that Ireland and the campaign for independence was having elsewhere in their empire. Retaining at least a part of Ireland was necessary for the United Kingdom to remain, quite frankly, united, even if the rest of the name of the state had to change. Fourth, and perhaps most importantly, um, uh, we cannot overlook the key point that my, modern Irish society was shaped through its relationships to empires, both living within one and resisting it. What are its legacies in terms of attitudes to race, to interconnections, to networks of ongoing contact? What are its legacies in the streets you walk, the statues you see, or indeed the post boxes you send your mail through, many of which still bear the mark of Queen Victoria, or in this case, of her son, Edward VII, under their green paint. What is the condition of the Irish language and how is it viewed in modern Ireland? I, I don't ask these questions to be provocative, except insofar as I believe they are worth asking as the people of Ireland consider their many and complex colonial legacies in the 21st century. Nowhere are these interconnections perhaps more evident today than in the Olympic pool in Japan, where Ireland's uh, Mona McSherry took eighth in the women's 100 meter breaststroke, while Hong Kong's Siobhan Bernadette Hahi, grand niece, of the former Taoiseach Charlie Hahi swims in the 200 meter freestyle. Hong Kong and Hahi, how postmodern a colonial moment is that? Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, would love to take questions. Okay, Tim, I will I'll start since we don't seem to have any other questions. Um, 
to what it's it probably comes back to something I think John Horn said. Just toggle my mic there because I thought I was getting a bit of reverb uh, in in the Mocknov um, seminar, yeah. which was there was an extent to which Irish people were comfortable with with a degree of Britishness, and I, and I think that that maybe that maybe plays out with it with the involvement with empire um for some you know obviously some fenians and things are in, in a different place but it, you know to what extent is that a phenomenon as people maybe feel as you said willie redmond maybe feels different from the british maybe yeah. even it's simple a matter of geography maybe they think and you know an island needs its own its own administration but they feel different from the british but they perhaps feel more different from the the maori or, or the indians you know, and, and yeah, I mean, I think like this is definitely something that, um, uh, you know, one encounters quite a bit. You know, I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting, uh, if you look at the rhetoric, for example, of a lot of the home rulers, and I don't just mean the MPs, some of the people who supported them, uh, uh, they, the, um, what, what they're interested in doing in the late 19th century is to prove that they're just as European as others, right? I mean, like one of the reasons why uh, the, the the Tory party um, was against home rule uh, was because as Lord Salisbury said, they're not fit to govern themselves. And, and he put the Irish in a racial category below uh, uh, Teutonic peoples, as he said, uh, uh, to the Union of Conservative Clubs. Um, uh, he made the comparison specifically to the Hottentots in the Cape um, and one of the things that you see is uh, uh, Irish home rulers saying, actually, we're, we're very white, we're very European. Now, there were plenty of, of members of the, uh, uh, the parliamentary party and of their supporters who were very much anti-empire, very much anti-British. I just, there's this whole spectrum uh, that I think we need to account for. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that John's point uh, in the Machna uh, was, it was a good one. Um, we shouldn't neglect that one of the reasons for that, of course, was schooling had been a certain way. The economy was organized a certain way. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm very cognizant of language shift in the 19th century. And one of the things that I saw in studying the Gaelic revival was that uh, people who, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, people who um, uh, were sending their children to schools were perfectly willing to have their kids continue to learn English, even though Irish was the home language. And the reason for that was they wanted to make certain that um, uh, uh, their children were ready to emigrate because they were going to depending uh, be depending on money coming from abroad and food from abroad or what have you uh, uh, to, to support them in later years. So uh, there is this element, I think, of of utility uh which makes sense if the window uh of your experience is one that is necessarily shaped by empire uh i think what's what's really interesting is to see how that is ultimately challenged from within uh and also through conversation with people also in the empire who want to break free there's uh, especially in the 20th century there's increasing contact between irish nationalists and nationalists from elsewhere uh, who are trying to undermine uh, the concept of empire? That's that's great. That's great. Sorry, sorry. I think we're getting yeah, reverb yeah, there again. I think it sounds better just now, doesn't it? Um, we've had two questions in, actually, from my dad. So thank you for that, Dad. Um, just there. Uh, one was what happened to the Irish gene pool in India, where. You know, there were large numbers of Irish in the civil services. You know, one detail you didn't mention, but often gets mentioned when uh, uh, when I'm around Trinity, is that you could do the Indian civil service exam in Trinity until 1948, when it's right. in in the re in in the UK itself. So, uh, so, so we're just wondering, do you know, you know, what happened? Did many of these people? I presume, I mean, my sense is many of the people involved in imperialism moved back either to Ireland or to Britain. I mean that's that that would be the sense I have, but I don't I, I I don't have numbers to back it up, right? I mean like I I can certainly point to people who who made that move. I mean I you know not into India, but like I would point out that Robert Hart when he retired 
uh, he actually moved to England. Um, his brother was in England. Uh, his wife, who had, from whom he'd been separated for decades, uh, was in England. Uh, he did tour throughout the United Kingdom. He made a series of speeches in 1908 uh, all over Ireland, was widely feted uh, as the person who knew uh, China better than anyone else, but uh, he ultimately settled back in England. And I suspect that you probably uh, have a similar phenomenon, but that's that's a subject I'm not familiar enough with to give a, a definitive answer. I mean, part of my reason for that sense, Tim, I think is that the I've seen other research on um, the Irish in Kenya during the Kenyan emergency. Yeah. I think a lot of, because Kenya was a common law jurisdiction, or a lot of Irish lawyers, et cetera, were involved there. But when they moved home, that experience necessarily didn't stand to them in terms of getting jobs, et cetera, and, and say barristers moving up and moving onto the bench, et cetera, in the way that um, connected barristers who were involved in politics here through Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael uh, tended to do. Yeah. Um, the other question we got from my dad, which was actually a question I was going to ask to you to speak to in general, was the Irish in Boston appeared very racist in the 1960s. Uh, around busing, etc. And if, if he was talking, he'd also have some choice experiences and language of, of dealing with Irish people when he was living in the States around the time himself. Um, and it just, where do you think this, this imperialism, this debate around imperialism and the Irish in the British Empire fits in with discussions about Irish integration in the United States through, yeah. you know, Irish in integration in the United States through their own racism, you know, how the Irish became white. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there, th this is a really complex answer. Uh, once again, I'm going to punt to people who are more expert than I. Um, uh, I would encourage uh, your dad to look at uh, the works of people like uh, my friend Matt O'Brien, uh, who's written a good bit on um, uh, Irish Boston uh, and, and has new material that's going to be coming out, I know. Um, but um, Couple of things I would I would mention. Uh, one is that um, uh, there the the history of the United States, of course, is one that is is rife uh, with uh, racial division, uh, and one route into power was to emphasize how you were more alike with the people in power, i.e., white people, uh, and uh, you know you you sort of step on the, the hand of, of the person below you on the ladder to make sure they don't get up. Uh, and I think there's there was a lot of that um, uh, in in Boston and elsewhere. Um, it's it's worth noting, of course, you know, as I said earlier, that there were people in Ireland who had really imbued that sense that we are European. Uh, and the, the racial element, uh, uh, once one got to the United States, I think, uh, 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 brings that out as well. Um, you know, probably the, you know, the darkest example uh, of that uh, from uh, an Irish nationalist perspective might be John Mitchell, right, who uh, uh, became not just an overt advocate of the Confederacy, but, um, uh, you know, his writings on race are just dripping uh, with anti-Black sentiment. Um, uh, so uh, I, I, I don't want to say Boston in the 1960s echoes, you know, Mitchell in the 1860s, but uh, I think there is something to that. Okay, good. Um, and we should note there's still a statue of John Mitchell in Newry. Indeed. And also, you, you know, you, if, you, if you read, you know, if you read any nationalist propaganda from around 1916, you'll see Mitchell invoked repeatedly. He was an abstentionist MP, et cetera. So a lot of a lot of later revolutionaries identified very closely with them. Question from Anya Monahan. Did our physical props, proximity to Britain have a bearing on how things played out? Like, were, was there more of a desire to for independence because of mm -hmm. close proximity? That's obviously the opposite of uh, Jan Smuts's argument, who, you know, told De Valera he couldn't get a republic because he... Uh, because we were too close to Britain, but uh, you know, what do you think? Yeah, um, I mean, this is more speculation on my part than anything. But I, I, I like, I like the question in that. Um, uh, I think proximity works in in both ways. Number one, it it emphasizes what you have in in common, but it also it also underlines what's what's different about you. Uh, and uh, one of the things that um, 
uh, I think, you know, made Ireland in the 20th century so distinctive uh, is that so much of the popular culture, so much of the, uh, if you will, the media airways down to the present day, of course, flows out of Britain, flows, you know, if you will, the, 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 the transatlantic Anglosphere, because the U.S. is is obviously involved in this, and there's there's obviously domestic uh, media in Ireland as well. But um, there's a there's a, a sense of domination where I think it's it's much easier, for instance, um, for an Irish person to speak to what's happening in Britain than a British person to to be what's happening in Ireland. <laughs> Dare I say Brexit? Right? I mean, we see this <laughs> we see this almost every day, uh, and um, uh, so I think proximity uh, did play a role both in exacerbating the the issues of inequality and then also presenting, if you will, um, a carrot to participate in empire also. Yeah, I mean, I think Martin, oh, that's a good, good way to segue into Martin, Martin O'Dee's question here, which is the war of independence was a political revolution and not a social revolution. He points out that Arthur Griffith aspired for Ireland to have its own colonies. And, you know, this is a case of we had become quite British in our outlook, language, etc. but we wanted to paddle our own canoe. I mean, I think that's a worthwhile point. I do think we need to remember that, that you know, later, and I mean, I saw a good article on this in the Irish Times, which might have been pushing it, but was talking about, you know, later Ireland is in some ways, even the Catholic nationalism, in some ways, a fusion of, you know, the old English identity and the kind of, Catholic Irish identity, so mm. the, the the mere Irish. I mean, I know we're we're jumping across centuries here, but it's worth remembering that that would have been that that kind of English identity would have always would have been a part of Ireland, and it's. I think you can see that in in the way um, Anglophone culture and British culture is is quite associated with urban centres and with the East Coast in around Louth, and you can see that in the War of Independence, where you see, you know, Sinn Fein win the seat in Louth in 1918, but they win it by a very narrow margin. So compared to, you know, the results in, in places like Cork and Tipperary, where they win, you know, yeah. it's four to one. So do you, you know, do you want to speak to that? To what extent was was the Irish participation in empire? I think it's similar to my, my point earlier, just a kind of a, a mindset born of, of, of um, British control of Ireland. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there, I, I would be sympathetic to that, at least to to a, a, a wide degree. Um, what I, th there's a couple of points I would make, and that is that um, empire. What, what we're we're very conscious of the way it's articulated by elites, whether they're Anglo-Irish, whether they're Catholic elites, uh, etc. Um, uh, I, I I am mindful though that you know, like if we look at at things like support for uh, mission activity, which again is not empire pure and simple, but it is a European. We're taking we're taking the religion and we're taking our culture and we're trying to show the backward, the heathen, the so forth, right? The 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 kinds of stereotypes about race that are suffusing European society. Um, that language is not only picked up by people up and down the social scale. But you can see organizations like the Society for African Missions, uh, which has, you know, um, uh, uh, a seminary in Cork and then later out in the West as well. Um, uh, they're actually much more successful in recruiting people into their ranks from lower down the social scale than the traditional, if you will, parish priest. Um, you know, if, if you look at, at Irish Catholicism in the late 19th century, something on the order of two thirds to three quarters of the priests, are the sons of, of strong farmers or the, the Catholic middle classes. Uh, but work that I've done on the SMA uh, would suggest that only about 41% of their recruits were coming from those ranks. And that you actually have even, you know, like the sons of urban working class people. Uh, and part of the reason for this is they've got bursaries. So that there, there is the educational prospect uh, for those kids. Um, but they're also, sending in their pennies. They're also responding to appeals. They're, um, so there are ways in which messages about non-whites, messages about non-Irish people abroad are infusing daily life up and down the social scale. Now, 
what people do with that, that bears further investigation. It's something that obviously I'm, I'm hoping to do more of, and, and I hope others will pick up the baton as well. But I, I, the, the first part of what Martin said there, I, 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 I want to push back a little on as well. I would agree entirely that the, in the main, the Irish Revolution, the War of Independence, uh, was a political revolution, not a social revolution. That said, the motivations for a lot of people participating uh, were social, and it depends on where one was on the island. Uh, one need only look at uh, the people who are grabbing at land and breaking down fences in the West, especially uh, to realize that there are echoes of the land war going on in the late 19 teens and early 1920s. And the reality is that the land acts, uh, which had been passed, had largely been stopped because of World War I. Uh, uh, you know, even people who had cut deals to become the owner occupiers of the lands where they were tenants, uh, the government stopped making payments so the sales didn't go through. So you had people who were waiting six, eight years before they actually got title to their farm. And that's the people who qualified under the land acts to buy the land. And there's a whole lot of the population that is still falling below the social rank of the tenant farmers who are allowed to buy. So there, there is a social impetus, even if the result of the revolution or the, the war of independence is not a social revolution. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, one kind of provocative phrase I try to use a few times is to say a conservative Catholic revolution for conservative Catholic people. But uh, sometimes, sometimes I do this. I just, yeah, I'll just make a couple yeah, of points no, on what you said in relation to Louth, which is yeah. um, just in terms of the, the spiritual empire, if you want to say, is of course. Uh, many, I should probably mention that the hospital in Drogheda was originally okay. built by the medical missionaries of missionaries of Mary as a huh. training training hospital, um, and that um, and one thing I've found in recent weeks doing some research on the War of Independence period in Louth is that actually it's quite it's I previously done Ross Common and it's quite interesting because Louth's quite a small county and it's still quite well covered by the RIC in 1920. There seems to be much less um, of that kind of land grabbing going on than, than yeah. you would see in other counties further west. And even I think you see in Meath to a degree, except one interesting point I think is that the Loud, or sorry, the Dundalk Town Council were waiting for a payment in relation to, a payment to be made to Lord Roden by the local government board who, who Lord Roden was the landlord around Dundalk and he owned a lot of land in the his domain covered a large chunk of what is now the center of Dundalk. And okay. the Dundalk Town Council postponed swearing allegiance to Dole Aaron in 1920 till after that payment went through, so they had control of the land. Wow. So um I'll I'll take the next two questions together because Trish and Sandy have two two questions um, which overlap. So okay. if, to what extent did Irish officials in empire see themselves as belonging to a race as opposed to a people or a nation? Hmm. And then Sandy's one is, uh, I'm very aware that the British used to call the Burmese the Irish of the East, with much interesting ambiguity in that idea. I think they may have called other peoples, perhaps the Koreans or even Indians, the same thing sometimes. I want, she wonders if you would come across this. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the two things together. Um, I would say, first of all, with regard to whether people saw themselves as members of a race as opposed to a nation or a people, uh, we need to remember that race was used almost interchangeably with nation at times, it, especially in the 19th century. Uh, I mentioned William Francis Butler, um, there's an extraordinary passage in uh, his book, The Great Lone Land, uh, which really made his name as a, a literary person. Um, uh, those of us, <laughs> Tom, you'll appreciate this. It, those of us who write uh, history for a living are always grateful when people write memoirs. Uh, and uh, Butler wrote basically after every campaign he was involved in, as well as a memoir. Uh, as well as some fiction. Uh, 
um, right? One of his his fictional stories was a a a, um, a book about uh, meeting a Native American called Red Cloud that was translated into Irish, and it was a school book in the 20s and 30s uh, in the Irish language. I think Angoom published it. Anyway, um, but this extraordinary passage from from Butler resonated with me because it took place in a train station in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And the same train station is there today. I mean, it's like literally a stone's throw from my office. So, uh, you know, like I'm reading this thing sitting at my desk going, you know, uh, you, you, you're going crazy. And he's talking about the races he is seeing on the on the train platform. And, and what he's doing is he's walking you through all the different immigrant groups who are here in Milwaukee in the 1870s. And he's got and and it's but it, you and I might today say he's talking about nationality, but he is attributing racial attributes to people of German extraction, Danish extraction, Irish extraction, uh, African Americans, and and you know so and and he's he's actually basically saying they're going to create a mongrel race, the American, and what will happen we don't know, you know and um, uh. So there's there there is a sense in which I think some people in the 19th century are using those terms interchangeably, um, right up into the 20th century, right uh, through the revolution. You've got Irish race conventions, uh, people who were in the diaspora and people from Ireland meeting, for example, in Paris. What was it, 1921, I think, uh, uh, and um, trying to come up with ideas on how the Irish should connect across the world. Um, uh, in the empire, however, let us say in India, uh, while in, in your unit, you recognize each other as distinct. The Irish are here, the Welsh are here, the English are here, etc. To indigenous Indians, you're all part of the same army. Now, the Irish actually within the Indian army had a very bad reputation. They were, they, their reputation was that they were very harsh uh, to, to Indians, and they, they were referred to in some instances as the Rishti. Um, uh, so there is, a, there is that uh, uh, element too, how you're being viewed by others. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that the Irish themselves will ultimately use when they settle in places like the United States. And while they are different, uh, uh, they are seen as different. They're seen as alien, especially if they're Catholic Irish, because that's an alien religion in Waspy America. Um, but they're white, and they play the white card, and and ultimately they they fall into the the so-called American melting pot. Um, with regard to the Burmese, uh, uh, Sandy's question, um, I have heard that kind of phrasing used. Um, uh, I also hear the the political parties, right? So like. Uh, Egyptian rebels, the, 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 you know, in in uh, in the late 19 teens, early 1920s, they're the Sinn Féin of Egypt, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, British officials, uh, essentially, they're trying to look for the parallel that they know from the experience they've had. And there's something, you know, in the the old notion from imperial studies of of the official mind, and the official mind in Britain tended to try and categorize according to what they knew. And for many, Ireland was often the first example they had, and so they would they would apply it elsewhere. Um, the Korean example, let me just pick up really quick too. Um, uh, one of my former students, a uh, brilliant uh, historian named Kenneth Shank, uh, has an essay in the collection uh, that Tom mentioned earlier, uh, Ireland in an Imperial World, uh, that talks about how uh, people from other empires look to Ireland as an example. And he actually begins with a story about a composer from Korea by the name of Ek Tai An. And um, uh, uh, Ek Tai uh, premiered what for him was essentially uh, a song about Korea. Uh, he was on a world tour and he visited capitals all around the world. He premiered his composition about Korea in Dublin consciously because he saw Dublin as the capital of a state that had broken free from an empire. Uh, and that song is now the national anthem of, of uh, South Korea. So it's kind of that kind of an interesting little tie-in. Thanks.
And, and Andrew, as O'Sullivan's asked a question here, just um, I just to what extent do you think we have failed? I mean, I know at the at the end of your talk there, you were urging urging people to engage with it, but but um, to what extent? How would you characterize the engagement thus far? Would you can say there's a failure to engage or failure to acknowledge Irish contributions to British imperialism? Uh, and he makes the the very reasonable comparison to Scotland there. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think it's a very uh, it's it's a fraught question, right? Because we, you know, uh, whether we're talking about people living in Ireland or scholars of Ireland, uh, you you have an impression of how how the Irish always viewed empire, how the Irish viewed the British relationship with Britain, um, and you know, anytime you you examine something and realize that it wasn't always so clean uh, or it wasn't always uh, in this or that, um, that 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 necessarily is is a challenge. For me, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of at the point now, uh, those of us who've been studying Ireland and empire, we've been doing what we might call prosopographical work. There were so many people in the army. There were so many people in the civil service, et cetera. Um, that we can say, okay, yeah, they're there. So what? That's the that's the question. I guess that's what I was trying to get at, at the end. We we're at that point where we have to say, so what? What does it mean? Um, uh, how do we balance out the reality of anti-imperialism with the reality of imperial participation, imperial buildup? Uh, the question earlier that referenced Griffith. Um, uh, you know, Willie Redmond. Uh, uh, after touring Australia in the early 20th century, uh, collected essays he had published in newspapers as a book called Through the New Commonwealth, in which he basically said, there's not a place on the globe where Ireland hasn't settled, where the, the children of Ireland aren't buried. Um, and it's it's almost a call for like Irish manifest destiny. Um, and yet this is somebody who also is against the idea of aggressive imperial expansion. I mean, how does that? How does? How do you reconcile that? You know, I mean, that's. I think that's where we are now. We have to. We have to push harder to understand that reality. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this, the Scottish comparisons are often interesting as well. And one. Yeah. One one aspect I find very interesting is that um, in the 1880s and 1890s there were Crofters candidates who were similar enough to the Irish Parliamentary Party. They were, you know, right. they they built their electoral base on land campaigning and actually the general election during the Boer War all of these candidates lose their seats because like the Irish Parliamentary Party as you described a lot of them oppose the war except that in the Highlands even more so than in Ireland there's such heavy recruitment into the British Army of course this is enough to this is enough to completely undermine their political base so they all lose their seats so there's yeah there's interesting parallels and there's interesting divergences there always it's, I think, the Scottish it's worth noting so like I I I stayed away from the border. I stayed away from from the north uh, a, a good bit here. But you know, like one of the things I would point out too, so the, the complexity of the First World War, right? Um, so the Parliamentary Party, as as I, I'm sure most of, of the people listening know, the Parliamentary Party, John Redmond encouraged people to enlist, in part because Home Rule was law, and and this was payback. This was, you know, we're going to show you how good we are. There was the promise to unionists that, that the, the, the act would be revisited. And I think Redmond was banking on if we prove our loyalty, there will be no need to revisit. Um, uh, as we know, it was revisited. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the First World War has become a, a major topic of, of uh, discussion in, in Irish historical circles. But it's interesting in the North, where especially the Unionist mythology, understandably, uh, uh, talks about the sacrifice on the Somme and sacrifices of the war. Um, those are spoken of almost entirely as Unionist sacrifices. And there were a lot of nationalists in the North who fought in World War One. Um, and one of the things that I'm seeing looking at, at uh, Boundary Commission testimonies, for example, are Catholic veterans who are already feeling excluded by that rhetoric in the early 1920s. Uh, and one of the reasons they are advocating for sections of what is Northern Ireland 
to be moved into the free state is they believe that they will be treated more honorably in the free state than they are in the north. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, Barry, our, uh, Louth, our producer here from Loud County Library Service, has asked us a question. Um, he's just wondering about your point about the, the UK need to hold on to part of Ireland during partition. Just do you wonder, could you expand on it? Do you have any examples of how this was viewed around the empire? Or was it just the UK's thinking of them themselves at the time? Yeah, I, I, both. Um, so uh, you're, you know, I mean, 1920 is a really interesting year. 1919, 1920 uh, across the British Empire is is fascinating. Uh, think about some of the examples, uh, uh, like major incidents that we know about. Amritsar, right? Uh, uh, you've got um, you've got a Connacht, the Connacht Rangers mutiny in India. You've got, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an uprising in Egypt. You've got an uprising in uh, the mandate in Mesopotamia. All of these things are coinciding with the Irish War of Independence. And so one of the things that you see cabinet doing as they're discussing how to deal with Ireland is they're, they're very aware of how things are being seen around the world, how different uh, uh, anti-colonial movements are watching the Irish. Um, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. Um, I've heard uh, Ireland's ambassador to the United States uh, speak on this. Uh, uh, ambassador Mulhall, one of his first postings was to uh, India uh, as a junior member of the, the foreign uh, office. And um, he had a chance to meet uh, uh, Madam Pandit, um, Nehru's sister, right? Uh, who was herself very much an active Indian nationalist. And, and she talked about how uh, uh, the hunger strike by Terence McSwinney was one of the things that elevated Ireland and, and a national consciousness and, and uh, about the, uh, you know, that the empire was not the, the great organization it had always been cracked up to be, right? Um, that was made clearer by uh, the McSwinney hunger strike than anything. And it just, it just elevated the, his, the political consciousness of her generation. Um, the British are aware that this kind of thing is happening. Um, and so if the United Kingdom is to break up entirely, right? I mean, it's not the United Kingdom without some portion of Ireland. Uh, uh, that That's indicating a weakness at the center uh, that they don't want to countenance. And in terms of that, then, where would you place the Russian Revolution? In that, in, that. in terms well, of their own, their, the British mentality. Just yeah, I mean, like, so I think um, where you where you hear echoes of that, of course, uh, in in Ireland, um, uh, and and in um, uh, discussions of of like the settlement with regard to uh, partition, um, uh, the the Unionists, for example. Uh, they only refer to the Labour Party government uh, of Ramsay MacDonald as the socialists, right? I mean, like they're never, it's never the Labour Party, it's the socialists. Um, and, and uh, of course, you know, you do have a very active uh, Labour presence in Ireland, uh, in, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in certain areas of Ireland <clears throat> during the War of Independence. So that international context is, is, is absolutely germane. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, interesting. I mean, one thing I, I always come back to with the British Labour Party is it's interesting that some British Labour Party publications on the uh, second week in December in 1921 condemn the treaty for not going far enough. And then they, right. they then have this problem that it's been uh, it's been accepted. So it's which is an interesting <laughs> an interesting turnaround. But I think it's something that's worth it's worth noting. I mean, it's also something the internal politics of Britain are, are something people should probably think about as well when they're thinking about yeah. these period. I mean, I mean, De Valera even says that in the Dáil in the 1921, at the, the, one of the clandestine meetings, that we need to make a, this government will fall at some point and we need to make a deal with this government because we're going to get it, after this, we're going to get a pure Tory government. So yep. it could be in a bit of bother. Yeah, well, and, and you think about, uh, I, 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 this is one of the points I'm going to be making uh, in 
uh, I've, I've made this in a couple of things I've written, but uh, uh, the book I'm working on right now about partition, um, you know, it, we, we don't we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but between uh, uh, the time of the truce and uh, the time that the Boundary Commission comes, you've got four different governments in Britain. You know, you, you've got a couple of general elections. You've got, I mean, like it, it's and it, it's an entirely different set of actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I mean, the one constant is Churchill, but he's flipped parties. So, you know, I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so just uh, Seamus Nevin here has made a point that Burmese political nationalism drew a lot on the Irish experience in part because it was influenced by a Dublin-born monk known as U Gamo Olaka. I'm terrible pronunciation, but I don't know. Do you know anything about that? I, I don't. That's great. That's very interesting to me. I I, I mean, I, I I mentioned Ken Shonk's work before. Um, there, there are plenty of, of people who are working on <clears throat> 20th century topics, uh, particularly mid, mid to late 20th century topics. And one of the things that I think is a really interesting phenomenon is the number of nationalists from overseas uh, who come to Ireland, um, uh, and in part, it's because of the inspiration they got from educators, people who, you know. So uh, I, I, again, I the 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 ongoing presence of missionaries is not necessarily an endorsement of empire. They're under the empire flag, but what they teach is not necessarily <laughs> let's wave the Union Jack. Um, and and uh, so. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, you know you you definitely see is is questions are asked of the teacher. What happened in Ireland? What can you tell us about what happened in Ireland? Who was Terence McSwinney? This kind of thing. And so um, uh, that that's uh, I did not know that, and I appreciate that, Seamus. Thank you. It's fascinating. Okay, uh, just uh, just you, since you're talking about teachers, I think Trish McCarthy has a common straw question there. Uh, thanks, Trish. You mentioned nuns. Just the influence of Irish governesses, also, and have you come across that? And do you have any views? Or, um, I mean, I, I I definitely see this in the case of some of these elites, um, uh, and you you know you also you also have to deal with the fact that if you've got families while you're in the colonial service, uh, you've got. Um, they, they usually will have governesses along, and that that is good, or, or they'll hire local governesses. Uh, so that is that is a phenomenon. Uh, it's not one that I've looked into, but I, I definitely uh, I take the point uh, uh, it, that's that's critically important. I mean, that's an interesting thing. I mean, and one thing I've, I you sometimes see in the census is the uh, the one time you see Church of England written on the census in Ireland is yes. often governesses because they hire um, governesses from England. So it's interesting to see uh, Irish governesses going you know, English governess is being born to Ireland and Irish governess is going out around yeah. the empire. Um, it's just a point here. Um, excellent talk. A fascinating and t- complex subject as we are forced to look inward and ask those hard questions of our place and contribution in and to the empire. However, I always think it is funny that a lot of the men and women of whom we are speaking had no idea that their actions would have such far-reaching consequences and would have us discussing it years later. We can't forget that many of them had few choices but to join the Empire due to poverty. A Dublin man, forget his name, who served with the British Army in World War II, supposedly said, I don't fight for king and country. I fight as I have no arse in my trousers. So then, yeah, the, the economic motivation. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, and I think uh, that, that that would be true of, of uh, uh, any volunteer army. Uh, you know, um, uh, that would be, I, I think, um, uh, you know, there, there, there were real incentives to do things like, you know, get a job with the army, get a job with, uh, with the, the constabulary in the 19th century. Not the least of them were that they got pensions. <laughs> there, there, there were no pensionable jobs, <laughs> it, yeah. but, but the, you know, the military and the constabulary had pensions. Um, and so you had, you definitely had people who joined uh, what what I think is an interesting phenomenon too, though, is that you have people uh, who's who are in multi generational families with associations with the military or with the constabulary, and and that suggests that there is an ethos in the house, whether it started out as that or not. Um, 
uh, and that's something that also I think deserves some consideration. Yeah, I'm quite yeah. a consensus with venture is in this. So not just the, yeah. not just the motivate, just just somebody you know a sense of a challenge, a sense of adventure. That's the, there's there, and I mean th this is this is I think it's worth remembering too that the British Empire wasn't the only one that Irish people served, right? I mean you like you. The, the the odd story of people joining the French Foreign Legion or something like this, right? That it's it's it, it it's a it's another it's it's a way of of, of as you say adventure. It's opportunity. I mean, like a, a relatively poor person, if they can get themselves to a new location, they might be able to set themselves up in a way they couldn't at home. Uh, and um, and of course, I mean, this is the this is the great story that that uh, uh, you know is constantly being told. Uh, about you know the streets paved with gold even in the United States, which they were not surprisingly. Um, uh, but but you know I mean you definitely have uh, you know that sense that, it, that the grass will be greener elsewhere, right? Um, what is it? What is it that the grass is greener and the streets are gold? I don't know. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I've, well, if if we've no we've no other questions, I've one um, slight question which you may not may not have an answer to or it may be hard to answer but it's it's more just to get your sense of it yeah we we see i mean you see we've seen david fitzpatrick's work about say the geography of nationalism and we see this so we can see a kind of an east-west split so places like mayo have quite a heavy quite you know whatever indi indicator you choose you want to use irish speakers yeah. um membership of nationalist organizations low recruitment into the british army to some degree as well number of percentage of catholics what um mayo was quite at the bottom so and and then what my point really is that in that kind of hodgepodge there's a low recruiting to the british army is important and low level of of imperial engagement do you sense any other can, sorry that's in the terms of the military in terms of the civilian engagement with the empire or military. Do you sense any regional variations? Have you come across in this, this work? Have you have you thought about it? Or, or? well, so uh, one of the things I would I would point to is uh, again the mission work. Um, and here it's it's uh, I just I, I I just gave a talk about this actually uh, similar format in Paris. Uh, um, but uh, it was uh, and there'll be there'll be an essay coming out next year on this. But um, uh, the the Society of African Missions tracing where their people come from. Uh, there's really an interesting split. Uh, it, it they're throughout the country, um, uh, throughout the island. Um, but there are distinct concentrations, and the reason I I suspect for them was because they are uh, uh, there's. One family member gets in, and then the next thing you know, that others, the, the, the family sees that it's a way for them to get education and to contribute to the church. Uh, one is that um, there are distinct clusters that are near where the uh, uh, where the um, seminaries are located, uh, and so it, it it seems clear that there is a relationship going on. But then there are these there there are clusters in in and around Belfast and in and around Dublin, and it seems to me that some of this is you know. A given parish has seen a, a, a boy go, uh, a sister go into the, the parallel, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, career with the nuns, um, and and it's an opportunity for them. Uh, and so I kind of think that's that's an element of this. Uh, so that, that kind of speaks to the recruitment in the army uh, from people who don't have other opportunities. That's you know? Okay. Thanks very much. So um, I think all that remains is to say thanks to Tim for a, a great talk and an illuminating evening. Our next lecture will be on the 17th of August with Dr. Fanula Walsh of the University College Dublin, who will be talking about Irish women and the Great War. And then we will also have a lecture series coming up in conjunction with Murray and Morn Council about partition and the border and various issues related to that. So hope hope to see you all then. So thank you and goodbye everyone. Bye Tim. Thank you.